Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I have with me today uh, Brother Eric and another guest I'm really happy to meet today is uh, Sister Cindy. Uh, so um, I'm, ho I'm looking forward to their uh, comments as we go through the book of Job. If you have not seen the previous episodes, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you will go back and watch those. So far, uh, I've already covered chapters 1 through 5, so we're going to pick up with Job chapter 6 today, but first let me ask uh, uh, Eric and Cindy just to say hi to everybody, and then we'll get started. Hello, and... Uh... This is the Holmos channel, D E H A L L M O, and this is uh, Cinderella. Hello. She works for me, and I work for her. Okay. Um, All right. Gonna... Let's get started then. I'm um, I'm going to look at this in the KJV, and then if necessary, you might look at it in a, another translation. But I think it's pretty straightforward uh, in the KJV. Um, Job chapter 6, verse 1, but Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were, th were throughly weighed, and my calamity laid in the balances together. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words are swallowed up. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Doth the wild ass bray when he hath grass? Or loweth the ox over his fodder? Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Oh, that I might have my request and that God would grant me the thing that I long for, even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Then should I yet have comfort. Yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is mine end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength and the strength of stones? Is or is my flesh of brass? Is not my help in me? And is wisdom driven quite from me? To him that is afflicted, pity should be shewed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. Uh, my brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as the stream of brooks they pass away which are blackish by reason of the ice, and wherein the snow is hid. What time they wax warm, they vanish. When it is hot, they are consumed out of their place. The paths of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish. The troops of Tima looked, and companies of Sheba waited for them. They were confounded because they had hoped. They came thither and were ashamed. For now ye are nothing, ye see my casting down, and are afraid. Did I say, bring unto me, or give a reward for me of your substance, or deliver me from the enemy's hand, or redeem me from the hand of the mighty? Teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words, but what doth your arguing reprove? Do ye imagine to reprove words and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as wind? Yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless, and ye dig a pit for your friend. Now, therefore, be content. Look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. Return, I pray. Let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again. My righteousness is in it. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? Well, uh, remember last time uh, on Wednesday, we're studying Proverbs and you were calling it a diatribe. 
<laughs> and I said, well, I think it's more of a soliloquy. And uh, today uh, it may be classified as a diatribe because it seems to me he is really uh, complaining about the, the uh, judgment from his friend. What was his friend's name? Asmineth or something? Or, and that, do you remember that uh, in the previous chapter how his friend, uh, they, didn't, they didn't say anything for, what was it, seven days. And then they finally decided to say something. And Job, um, they thought Job was, must be guilty of something. They said, why else would this happen unless you have some guilt? You better realize what you've done wrong and repent. Uh, and Job said, no, it's not because he's done anything wrong. So there's an argument between his friends taking the position that this, these bad things have happened to you because of you. You deserve it somehow. And, Judge, and Job is not admitting that he deserves it. So that's, that's the dispute. And this uh, whole chapter here reads like a diatribe. So uh, Brother Eric, Sister Cindy, what's your reaction? I'm gonna read this again as slowly in the Amplified after we uh, get your initial reaction to it. Okay, Brother Luke, uh, Cinderella will be uh, viewing uh, only yeah, she's not a talker. so uh i will be handling all the responses uh, myself and uh i'm glad to see that we finally have a, a diatribe that i was wanting in fact it appears that there will be many diatribes to come in this book okay um yeah, uh, and again, I think this is a time it would probably be helpful uh, if if someone has not uh, viewed the and listened to the previous studies on this chapters one through five to get the context. But basically, uh, as, as succinctly as I can put it, the context is that uh, that the devil, Satan, appeared before God, and and. Uh, he's there to accuse humanity, and God says, well, what about Job? Have you considered Job? And then uh, God, the devil says, well, yeah, you, th you think Job's really good, but what happens if you stop blessing him? If you take away the things he has, and, you, and if, you, if you take away his health and you afflict him, he will curse you. He's only because you're so blessed you so blessed Job that he praises you and loves you. And so God gives Satan permission to persecute and torment Job by taking away his family, they're killed, and then by taking away his health where he has these boils and sores all over his body. And, and yet uh, Job at this point is, will, will not curse God as his wife suggests. His wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? You've, you're suffering so much. Look at all the loss and suffering. Just curse God and have him kill you and be, be, have this end. And he, he will not curse God. Now he has his so-called friends come. And he's, your friends should be there to help you and encourage you. But they're just pointing the finger at him. Or at least the first one is pointing the finger at him and saying, Job, it's, all this bad has to be the result of you having some sin in your life. Uh, I've had people say things like that to me when I was out, you know, I, I spent years preaching in my wheelchair and I had these health problems and people would say, uh, let, let me pray for you and, and for healing. And I, I, I'm always anxious to have people's prayers for me, but they, they, th these people would conclude that if you're not healed, it's because there's some sin in your life or because your faith is weak. And uh, I was felt in the same kind of position like, like Job. No, it's, I, I'm not in the wheelchair because of sin in my life or because of weak faith. But that's, that's what the, there's a movement today, the name it and claim it, the faith movement. They, they, they think that God is somehow our servant and he must 
say yes every time we if we pray for something if we get the center of our life and we pray that he's obligated to say yes but god's not obligated to say yes to our prayer requests and so those people they make god the servant and us the god god has to obey us and this is the kind of thinking that we see in job where uh, the people are accusing job of deserving these bad things um, okay so brother comment on that and then i'll go back through this and and read this more slowly in the amplified we'll analyze a little bit more verse by verse okay brother luke thank you for pointing that out the fact that uh people do in fact point that judgmental finger at us uh when uh we're ailing about something and uh as a matter of fact cinderella and myself were discussing that earlier today and i told her no don't feel that your faith isn't strong enough uh we adhere to god's biblical recipe for salvation and we do that on a daily basis and we believe in god's promises and uh if you need to go see the doctor that's uh perfectly fine as well okay all right thank you brother and uh i know brother bill has made numerous videos um against the um word of faith movement and uh you know i've spoken out against it myself but they are they do so much harm to people um god god is not our servant to to you know just provide everything that we demand of him through prayer uh so uh if you're afflicted somehow if something bad happens here in, in your life it's health health or or um you're lacking something uh, you know you need prosperity you're 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 wanting uh, uh some fi you have financial needs and don't think that it's these things are necessarily the result of anything you've done uh, sometimes uh, bad fortune comes upon people and it's no fault of their own uh, sometimes as we learned in proverbs though that uh uh, there are consequences for our behavior too. If a person's lazy, they should not expect to be prosperous. If a person is, uh, uh, you know, doing all kinds of bad behavior, uh, they're uh, pursuing strange women and uh, not being faithful to their wife, they should expect some bad consequences to come back because of their behavior. So there is a law of cause and effect, the, the law of reaping and sowing that applies to all people, whether you're Christian or not, that law will, will uh, apply to us. But some people are just real anxious to immediately blame any misfortune that falls upon us, upon uh, our, the sin in our life or a lack of faith. So I, I, I would denounce that, that doctrine. Now let's go through this um, in the Amplified. I read it more slowly. It's, I think it may make more sense. Uh, Job answered and said, he's answering his friend. Let me see, what is his friend's? Do you remember the name of his friend? He had some strange name like Eliphaz or something, Eliphaz. That's right, Brother Luke. It was Eliphaz the Tenemite. Yes. Okay. Uh, then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief could actually be weighed and placed in the balances together with my tragedy to see if my grief is the grief of a coward. Um, so Job is, is saying that he is, is he a coward? Is, is he a, the guilty party? Um, or, or because he's... Uh, um, when when Job finally spoke, uh, remember what he said, brother, when he didn't talk for seven days and then he spoke? Uh, was it Job that first spoke? I thought it was uh, his friends that first spoke. Uh, I think Job uh, spoke first, and he, what he spoke 
was not repentance and 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 uh, accepting blame the way his friends wanted him to. It was uh, that uh, why is why is God doing this to me? Was his question, if I recall, why is God doing this to me? I don't I don't deserve this. And his friends expected him to say, uh, you know, I'm guilty and I need to repent. And so um, that was that's what started the argument with his friend is that uh, his friend said, no, you you must be guilty of something. Uh, so now um, he says in verse three, for now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been incoherent because the arrows of the almighty are within me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. So he's going on to say uh, he's, he's complaining. He, he's, he's crying out to his friends and, and to God that, uh, you know, why is this happening to me? Uh, why has God turned against me? He doesn't realize that God's not doing it to him, but God is permitting it. And as we said, I remember when I asked the question, why is it that you think that God even allowed Satan to do these bad things to Job? And we, we answered that in the last episode, but I guess it's worth, uh, it's worth repeating. Brother, uh, what was your conclusion about the reason that God permitted Satan to do these bad things to Job? Well, Brother Luke, if I recall correctly, I wavered out of that question due to uh, past uh, uh, problems I had with it. Well, if I, I remember Bill, he, he had three, three explanations, and I, I, I lean towards the, the third explanation as, the, as the, the, the real key to this book and these events. And that is that the fact that we are discussing Job's story today uh, is justification for this happening, because we are going to learn from Job's experience. And I remember in my life what I've had uh, suffering. Uh, it was uh, was wasn't hard for me to relate to Job, and say, whatever bad thing is happening to me, it doesn't compare to Job. And and, and uh, uh, so we learn perspective from Job. Uh, Job suffered for our benefit, in a way because we, we are going to learn from this story and be able to apply it to our, to our lives and be inspired. So uh, to me, that's the primary reason that, uh, that uh, this book was written and this, this, that's the way that this all played out. Um, now in verse five, does the wild donkey bray when he has grass or does the ox low over his fodder? Can something that has no taste to it be eaten without salt? Or is there any flavor in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. Such things are like loathsome food to me, sickening and repugnant. Oh, that my request would come to pass and that God would grant me the thing that I hope for. Uh, what is it that he hoped for? Do you remember that? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, I think he goes on to state it in the next verse. Okay. Uh, I wish that I would please God to crush me. I wish that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Uh, yeah, it does. That's what he had said before, and that's what upset his friend, his <laughs> so-called friend, Aliphaz, the Temanite, uh, because Job's Job's response to God to to his circumstances was God just please just kill me. He wouldn't curse God, as his wife suggested, because he's not blaming God. He's saying God God can do with what with me whatever he wants. He said God blessed me and God can unbless me if he wants. It's up to God. 
he wasn't complaining uh, to God about that. And he was just saying, well, now all these bad things are happening. Will you just cut me off and end my life? And I think that's a reasonable thing. I, I, I don't know if anybody watching this now have ever reached the point in their life where they said, it would be better if I was dead. But I, I know that uh, I have a relative right now that is, has been uh, near death for months. And you know, I've been praying every day that, that God would take her because this is a long, slow, painful, difficult death that she's going through. And if a person is suffering enough, they it, it's very understandable that they would say, just crush me, take me away, end it all now. I'm, I'm suffering too much. I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever suffered that much in my life. Uh, I've, I've suffered a, a lot, and, but in some ways, and that, but I don't recall ever reaching the point where it's, God just killed me now. Uh, can you relate to this at all in your life, brother? Yes, Brother Lou. I, absolutely. I, I think many, many people can. And uh, I've even today I was reading a girl's comments on YouTube that was stating uh, that same sentiment. And uh, I think it's a, a big problem with a lot of people. And uh, Jesus Christ is the solution to their problems. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a series of videos called Q&A videos where people send me questions and I answer the, answer the question in the video. And one of the questions was about death. What, what kind of death is desirable? And... Uh, I, I've, I've thought about that quite a bit, maybe more than I, I should have in my life, you know, I, because I've, I've seen several people in my life suffer as they died. And uh, I don't desire to, to, to suffer, particularly suffer over a long period of time and have a slow, difficult death. Uh, and, I, and then I, I know that my mother as far as I know, one one day we, we got up and, and she was uh, had passed away. And as far as we know, she just died peacefully in her sleep. And so which is more desirable? To die peacefully, just go to sleep one night and then go be with the Lord with no suffering? Or to have a an ordeal like Job is going through? And the ends but the ends in death. Uh, the advantage of a slower death is that you have time to tell everybody you, you, you know and love how you feel if you hadn't done it before. If we haven't taken the time before, then uh, it's, uh, I, I hope that this little video will right now will inspire everybody. Don't leave anything unsaid. Those people that you love in your life, and if you've never taken the time to tell them, make sure you tell them. Because you may not have the opportunity, you, you, you just, the Bible says life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and then disappears. And so you don't know the day or the hour of your death. Uh, so make sure you take time now to tell everybody you love how you feel so that there's no regrets. But on the other hand, if you do have a slow, slow death, then... Um, it's an opportunity for a testimony. Um, how do you deal with that death? Uh, it's easy for me to say right now that I love Jesus and he, because he's blessed me so much. And when everything's going good, it's easy to praise God. But the, the most meaningful powerful testimonies is when we praise jesus 
as Paul and Silas did in prison. They're singing hymns and praising Jesus while they're in chains. It, it's more meaningful and powerful for someone to praise Jesus as their flames are engulfing them when they're burned at the stake. And there's historical records of many who have done that as they're being uh, tormented and uh, as martyrs and suffering, they're praising Jesus. That's when the testimony has more power. That's why the church boomed in the first century because as the church became per, cross, uh, persecuted, when people observed how the early Christians behaved in their, as they suffered, it was so unexpected that people thought, wow, uh, they really have a lot of faith. They are praising this Jesus even as they're suffering. And that's why the church uh, inspired so many people to believe in the beginning. So, you know, I've, I'm not asking the Lord for a, a slow, difficult death so I can have a chance to try to be an example and an inspiration to people. I don't know how I would deal with it. I know how I dealt with it uh, last year as I, I was in the hospital over and over again and with all kinds of surgeries and complications. I know how I dealt with it. And, and people told me that I inspired them. And all the while, they didn't know that inside I was ashamed of myself because I felt that I was not handling it the way I, I wished I would. So these things are really, these trials are tests for us. They're opportunities for us uh, in our testimony. But you know, I would never wish it upon anybody. But if it happens, I, I, you know, I pray that we have the strength to, to be a, uh, for it to be a positive testimony for the Lord. Uh, I'm going to move on, brother. Is there anything you want to say about the, that? Anything before I carry on here? Uh, yes, brother Luke. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for sharing that uh, wonderful soliloquy uh, about uh, your experience in that area. And I'd like to take this moment to opportunity to uh, show my appreciation for you uh, and brother uh, Sam and brother Bill and all my lawyers and disciples and how much I appreciate and love them uh, because you never know I could go at any minute. <laughs> All right, bro. Thank you. You didn't, you didn't uh, delay at all taking advantage of, of uh, my my uh, uh, encouragement for you to tell everybody how much you what they mean to you. Um, all right, let's go on. And um, verse nine says that he would loose his hand and cut me off. So Job is is saying, uh, you know, his request is God just ended all. I'm suffering too much. And then verse 10, then I would still have consolation and I would jump for joy and amid unsparing pain that I have not denied or hidden the words of the Holy One. Uh, so he, he, here he, he's saying exactly what we've been talking about, that even amid the pain and suffering that he has not uh, denied the Lord or, or, or stopped uh, you know, saying, it, I'm not blaming God. I'm not blaming God. He has, he's been blessed me in my life. I'm not going to uh, blame him or curse him. Uh, verse 11, what strength do I have left that I should wait and hope? And what is ahead of me that I should be patient and endure? Is my strength and endurance that of stones or is my flesh made of bronze? It is it that I have no help within myself and that success and wisdom have been driven from me? From the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friend so that he does not abandon, turn away from the fear of the Almighty. But my, my brothers have acted deceitfully like a brook, like the torrents of brooks that vanish, which are dull and dirty because of ice and into which the snow melts and hides itself. 
When it is warm, they are silent and cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their course wind along. They go up into nothing and perish. Your counsel is as helpful to me as a dry st st streamed in the heat summer. So he's certainly not, he's not blaming God. He's not cursing God. He, he's, but he is blaming his friend for not being a friend. Instead of his friend trying to console him, uh, sometimes there's not much you can say to people when they're suffering. Sometimes the best thing you can do is nothing. As, 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 as these three so-called friends did the first seven days, they said nothing. Sometimes a person is so distraught that there's no words to comfort them. And the scripture tells us somewhere that when someone is weeping, we should weep with them. It would be inappropriate when someone is so distraught to try to be positive and try to put a positive spin on it. You know, that's the time a person, sometimes someone doesn't want to hear any positive spin. They don't want to hear anything. The best thing we can do is just weep along with them and, and share in their sorrow. And they, they were right the way they were the first seven days. But then when they finally spoke, this Aliphaz, he says the exact opposite of what, what he should have said. He's blaming Job for the problems, saying, you must be guilty. That's why this is happening to you. And Job is now, he's quite upset with his so-called friend. And, and that's where we are now in the story. Uh, Brother Eric, anything before I go on? Uh, yes, Brother Luke. I would just like to point out uh, the very uh, eloquent style of uh, diatribes that we are uh, currently uh, examining. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing in Proverbs on last Wednesday that we got into this uh, subject about what is a diatribe and what is a soliloquy, because uh, um, even though last on Wednesday it wasn't a diatribe, we certainly are in the middle of one right now. Uh, so now we'll go on. Um, uh, verse 19, the caravans of Tima looked for water. The caravans of Sheba waited for them in vain. They were put to shame and disappointed because they had trusted that they would find water. They came there and were ashamed. Indeed, you have now become like a dried up stream. You see a terror believing me to be a victim of the wrath of God and are afraid to be compassionate. Did I ever say, give me something or pay a bribe for me from your wealth or rescue me from the adversary's hand? or redeem me from the hand of the tyrants? Teach me and I will be silent and show me how I have erred. How painful are words of honesty, but what does your argument prove? Do you intend to reprove my words with a convincing argument when the words of one in despair belong to the wind and go ignored? You would cast lots or gamble over the fatherless and bargain away your friend. Now, please look at me and see if I lie to your face, for you know that I would not. Turn away from your suspicion that there be no injustice. Turn away. My righteousness and vindication is still in it. Is there injustice or malice on my tongue? Can my palate not discern what is destructive? Well, I got to say that... Um, I find it extremely helpful in this case to read this in the Amplified Translation. Um, I've said this many times that my viewpoint on Scripture is I'm a KJV firstist. Some of you watching this, I know that some people take a, a, 
a more, I think, a more extreme position, and they are KJV onlyist. I held that position for more than 25 years. Uh, but uh, I, I've at the point where I think that the KJV is what I want to read first because uh, for the reasons I've cited before, that the uh, that the manuscripts that are used have some verses that the more modern translations don't use. For that reason, I want to read the KJV. But for this reason, you see today, I want to read another translation because I just, as, even though I am an educated person, even I was struggling to really get the gist of this chapter as I read the KJV. So I found that this amplified version was far easier to understand exactly what's going on here. And I'm going to ask you, uh, Brother Erica, did you, did you get the same kind of reaction when I read the KJV and then when I read the Amplified? Do you, do you feel that it was much easier to understand, more beneficial to us uh, in the Amplified, or, or, or are you far better at understanding that old English than me? Well, Brother Luke, uh, amazingly enough, I was just uh, thinking the same thing uh, how the Amplified version really shines uh, uh, in this instance more so than uh, when we were reading the book of Proverbs, for example. Um, yeah, we did the same thing in the book of Proverbs, but it seemed to me that uh, in most cases, the book of Proverbs was much easier to understand and the Amplified did not really amplify that much. It didn't really expand or expound or, uh, you know, enlighten us further. It was helpful to a certain extent, but in this case today, uh, I found it to be very helpful. So, but to sum this all up, this Aliphaz has been pointing the finger at Job saying the reason for your problems is go job look in the mirror it's got to be you a analyze your life figure out where your sin is and repent because uh, this is this is a result of something you've done that's why god is doing this to me and job is saying no it's not god that's doing this to me at all i'm not blaming god uh, it's, i'm not blaming myself i'm not guilty god's not punishing me uh and so that's where we find ourselves now. I'll move on to the next chapter. And I'll, let's try this again. I'll read it in the KJV first. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see if it's, we have the same problem. Uh, KJV. Okay. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hireling? As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, and as a hireling looketh for the reward of his work, so am I made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise, and the, and the night be gone? I am full of tossings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. My, my Mine eye shall no more see good. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a whale? that thou setteth a watch over me? When I say, my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall see ease my complaints. 
Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. I loathe it. I would not live alway. Let me alone, for my days are vanity. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? How long wilt thou not depart from me, nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? I have sinned, and what shall I do unto thee? O thou preserver of men, why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? And why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? And, and now shall I sleep in the dust, and thou shalt seek in the morning, but I shalt not be. Hmm. All right, brother. I think I followed most of that. Uh, what's your what's your take on that chapter? Well, brother Luke, uh, it looks like it's continuing on from the previous chapter, and then from replying to Eliphaz, he goes on to uh, correspond with God. Okay, uh, I want to read that also in the Amplified, and and we'll compare again and see if we, we gain anything from reading it. It, it. it seems pretty straightforward compared to the, the previous chapter. Let me see. Amplified. Okay, is not man forced to labor on earth? Are, are, and are not his days like the days of a hired man? As a slave earnestly longs for the shade, and as a hired man eagerly awaits his wages, so am I allotted months of futility and suffering, and long nights of trouble and misery are appointed to me. Let me stop there. Uh, um, I, I will say that you know, I, I've talked, I've talked uh, in in the past about uh, the difficult year, twenty fourteen, how difficult that was for me, and and now things are far better. Uh, my health is greatly improved, and my life really has. Uh, I have very little to complain about. Uh, my needs are provided. I have. Uh, loving wife and son and friends and family and just great, great blessings. And yet, I have to admit, there are times where I'm, I'm praying, Lord, I just, I would rather be gone. And even in the middle of a wonderful life, I'm thinking, kind of like Job here, it seemed like life is, is toilsome. Even even in the middle of what I have is a very blessed life. I still have, as I'm getting older, physically, it's life is more difficult. It's a struggle just getting older. Even though I'm not suffering uh, as I did in 2014, it, it seems like, as it says here, I can really identify with these first few verses. Uh, so am I allotted months of futility and suffering and long nights of trouble and misery are appointed to me. It just seems like, uh, you know, I'm, I think that as I'm saying this right now, somebody watching this might say, hey, well, stop, stop your complaining. You know, your, your life is blessed and why are you complaining about it? But I'm just going to tell you honestly that, um, Oftentimes in prayer, I, I will say, Lord, I'm just, I'm tired of life. I really am. Uh, I see the creation. I'll go out and play golf and see a beautiful golf course and, and, and look up at the sky and look at the mountains and just be in awe of creation. 
and 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 and, and then uh, on the other hand i'd like to be gone from it i did a a 50 hour study on the subject of heaven i have a playlist called 50 hours in heaven <clears throat> matter of fact tomorrow i think i'm going to share that playlist <clears throat> on google plus so i hope everybody will watch it 50 hours studying the subject of heaven and because i've studied heaven so much i'm anxious to get there <clears throat> i i know that uh there's wonderful things in this world right now as i said i've got a lot of things to be thankful for i've got a, a lot of reasons to to praise the lord and yet as paul said to live as christ but to die as gain so uh maybe maybe you can't identify with what i'm saying this saying right now but because maybe you're you're young and healthy and feeling great and but uh you know for me every day i ache and every day is physically difficult it's it's better than it was last year but as I, as you get older it, that life gets more difficult and I, for me, in my case, I know that there's probably many people that would say, uh, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Come now, Lord. Come, take me now. Um, oh, brother, brother, enough of my uh, 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 venting there. But uh, what's, what's your reaction to these first few verses here as Job is talking about the toils of life? Well, Brother Luke. You kind of threw me off my horse there, <laughs> but I'm back on, and I just want you to know that you're not going nowhere. <laughs> I need you here, okay? Uh, no man knoweth the day or the hour uh, of uh, the, the return of the Lord. And we also do not know the day or the hour of our, our departure. Uh, I've often seen street preachers talking about end times. They say, the end is coming. Jesus is returning. And all that's true. But uh, I've said, look, uh, the, whether the end of the world is coming this week or next week or next year or 10 years from now, that's not the point. The end of your world is coming soon. Even if you live to be 70, the Bible says we man is given uh, three score and 10. We're given 70 years. Maybe you'll live 80 years, maybe longer. But uh, even 80 years or 90 years, is it, it goes by like that. Time for me, is has speeded up so much over the last few years and i'll be 65 in november and if i have 15 more years here i expect it's going to go by like that and so um life is short when you it, it seems like it's going to be long when we're young and we look ahead i remember when i was a little boy playing little league baseball and I said, I thought ahead, I said, I was born in 1950 in the year 2000, off in the distant future, I'll be 50 years old. And guess what? That's long past now. And it seemed like it's gone by like that. So my point is that um, uh, we don't need to contemplate about the world ending because each individual person, our own world, individual world is ending. And we're going to be going on to the judgment. So um, I'm not going to do anything to speed it up, brother. You know, I don't, I don't believe in, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that, of course. But I know that, you know, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm in agreement with the Apostle Paul when, when he says that uh, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I am looking forward to eternity. But, you know, as long as I'm here, he says to live as, as Christ. Well, that, mean, that means that as long as we're alive in this world, 
let's stay focused on Christ. And I'm glad that you're here with me today, and Sister Cindy is here with me, and that we, we can share this time together thinking about Christ and the scriptures. But uh, far better to be with the Lord, as Paul said. Uh, all right, let's go, let's go on and look at more of this. Uh, it says, uh, verse 4, When I lay down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be gone? But the night continues. And I am continually tossing until the dawning of day. My body is clothed with worms and a crust of dust. My skin is hardened and broken and loathsome and breaks out and runs. You see, Job's been cursed with the boils from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Uh, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Remember that my life is but breath, a puff of wind, a sigh. So he's saying here what it says in the book of James, life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and it's gone. That's, that's something for us all to consider that it's, it's going to be the end. It's going to, your life will be pretty soon before you know it. You'll look back and say, it's been 70 years. It's been 80 years. And where did, where did time go? He says, remember that my life is but breath, a puff of wind, a sigh. My eye will not see good again. The eye of him who sees me now will see me no more. So that's talking, been referring to his friends there. Your eyes will be upon me, but I will not be. As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so, so he who goes down to Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead, does not come up. He will not return again to his house, nor will his place know about him anymore. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul, O Lord. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint. Then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me with through visions so that I would choose suffocation, death rather than my pain. I waste away and loathe my life. I will not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath, futile and without substance. What is man that you should magnify him and think him important and that you are concerned about him? That's a good place to stop here to get your reaction here. I mean, up to this point now, what's your, what's your reaction? This is really, really heavy, heavy stuff he's saying here. Uh, yes, Brother Luke, I was just basking in it and enjoying it, enjoying reading it the second time. We could read it three or four times, and I'm still going to enjoy it. You you must be a sadistic person <laughs> to enjoy it. <laughs> I I I enjoy the beauty of his expression, the what he's expressing in in, in a very powerful way. But it's it's it, he's in torment. He just doesn't want to live any longer, and he's suffering so much. And I'm wondering how many people have reached that point in their lives. You know, uh, it it's it, it's not up for us individually to end our lives, to, you know, that, that is, will be determined when it, sometimes I don't think, I, I don't think that God ends every life. I think that sometimes people's lives end because of an accident or because of a, a, some kind of a disease that God did not afflict upon them or uh, God knows the end. He's omniscient, but God does not cause the death of every person. Uh, but in this case, he's 
wanting to be dead because he's suffering so much. And there's people probably that feel that bad right now and want the suffering to end. And should they end it themselves? No, no it's, it's not for man to end his life. Uh, there's a there's quite a, uh, a movement over the last probably 20 years that I've observed it of people thinking that life is life in the womb is not important and the life of the aged is not important. You just take this pill and you know uh, healthcare is too expensive. Just take this pill. You're, you're an expense to the society. You're an expense to your family. Take this pill and end it, and you'll be doing everybody a favor. Uh, end your suffering. Uh, euthanasia. But uh, it's not for up, up to us to uh, cause our own end. Uh, Job isn't even considering that here. He's, he's hoping God will end it, but he's not willing to do it himself because it's not up to man to end his own life. Okay, brother, before I go on, any response to that? Well, Brother Luke, uh, I was just thinking, uh, Job is not a coward to take his own life. So uh, he's just uh, left it in the Lord's hands and uh but he sure is going to complain about uh what he's going through uh he knows uh he hasn't uh done anything to bring it upon himself okay yeah all right uh let me see um verse 16 no, it's at 15, so that I would choose suffocation, death rather than my pain. 16, I waste away and loathe my life. I will not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath, futile and without substance. What is man that you should magnify him and think him important and that you are concerned about him? That's a good question. Uh, uh, God's going to be asking Job some questions, as I recall, in some future chapters. Uh, he's going to, <laughs> uh, but uh, now he's asking God, why do you even care about man? Uh, what's your response to that, to that brother? And he's, he's saying, why do you even care about man? I mean, I haven't, how many people have wondered, look, if, when you think about creation, only recently has man even understood the vastness of the universe. But when we understand, <clears throat> okay, I've got trillions of cells in my body. Each cell is like a, a, like a world of its own. And then all these cells make up the, my, my tissues and then my organs and then my bodily systems and then me as a whole. And then there's billions of us, seven billion of us on the world right now. And then each one of us is just like a, a, almost like a grain of sand on the earth. And then the earth is just like a grain of sand in the galaxy. And the galaxy is like a grain of sand in the universe. And then why, when we are just smaller than a smallest speck, when you consider the vastness of creation, who is man that God should even care about us? Have you ever considered that, brother? Well, uh, I'm sure I have. Uh, I cannot uh, recall the instance that I did right off the top of my head. But uh, absolutely, the next two verses really stand out to me. Would this be the first time that Job is replying to God in, in the book of Job? It's the first time he's doing what? Uh. I was wondering, 
is this the first instance where Job uh, speaks to God in this book? Uh, I don't remember for sure. I think he has uh, spoken to God in prior chapters, but I can't say for sure without going back. I don't recall. But uh, the next couple of verses you referenced, uh, so he says, and that he says, what is man that you should magnify him? Well, we were made in God's image. We know that. We know that, uh, uh, and I believe that all of creation was made for man. I mean, we are the um, we are the crowning achievement of God's creation, according to the scriptures. And because we're made in God's image, God didn't make animals or the mountains or the streams in his image. He made man in his image. And he says, what is man that you should magnify him and think him important? Well, that's that's the key to it. We're important because God made us in his image for fellowship with him. And in verse 18, and that you examine him every morning and try and test him every moment. Will you never turn your gaze away from me? It plagues me, nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle. I don't know what swallow my spittle means here. Um, will you never turn your gaze away from me? It plagues me. Is that saying that, well, God, you're always watching me? I mean, I can never hide from you. Everything is, uh, I do, every thought. There is no secrets. Remember, we discussed this same point in Proverbs the other day. Uh, if I have sinned, what harm have I done to you? O watcher of mankind, why have you set me as a target for you? so that I am a burden to myself. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my sin and guilt? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will not be. Wow. So he's reached a point where... Uh, he, he's say, saying to God, if I have sinned, if it's true that that uh, something I've done to to deserve this, won't you just won't you forgive me? He's not aware of anything. That's what he's claimed before. He's not aware of anything that he's done to to deserve this. But now he's asking God, if I have sinned, what harm have I done to you? watcher of mankind that's god why have you set me a tar as a target for you so he's starting to think now that maybe aliphaz is correct that uh did I, do i am i do i really deserve this all right we're going to go on to the next chapter job eight uh I'm going to read it in the uh, Amplified right initially here. It says, Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, Okay, so this is the second of his <laughs> so-called friends now. He's finally saying something here. How long will you say these things? And will the words of your mouth be a mighty wind? Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert righteousness? If your children have sinned against him, then he has handed them over to the power of their transgression and punished them. If you would diligently seek God and implore the compassion and favor of the Almighty, then if you are pure and upright, surely now he will awaken for you and restore your righteous place. Though your beginning was insignificant, yet your end will greatly increase. Inquire, please, of past generations and consider and apply yourself to the things searched out by their fathers. 
for we are only of yesterday and now and know nothing uh, because our days on earth are like a shadow and just a breath or a vapor. Will they, the fathers, not teach you and tell you and utter words from their hearts, the deepest part of their nature? Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the rushes and, or reed grass grow without water? While it is still green in flower and not cut down, yet it withers before any other plant when, when without water. So are the paths of all who forget God and the hope of all the godless will perish. For his confidence is fragile and breaks, and his trust is like a spider's web. He trusts in his house, but it does not stand. He holds tightly to it, but it does not endure. He thrives and ponders like a green plant before the sun, and his branches spread out over his garden. His godless roots are wrapped around a pile of rocks, and he gazes at a house of stones. If he is snatched from his place in the garden, then his place will forget him, saying, I have never seen you. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and from out in, of the dust others will spring up and grow to take his place. Now, behold, God will not reject a man of integrity, nor will he strengthen or support his evil evildoers. He, he will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips of jo with joyful shouting if you are found blameless. Those who hate you will be clothed without shame, and the tents of the wicked will, no, will be no longer. So we heard from Aliphaz, now we hear from Bildad, the Shuhite. These are the things that his friends are saying to him. <laughs> All right, what's your reaction to Bill, Billhead? What's the name? Bildad? Bildad. I'd like to, uh, at this time, take the opportunity to thank uh, Kent Hovind for pointing out that Bildad is the shortest man in the Bible. He's the short, shortest man? And how did he arrive at that? I've never, I don't see anything to uh, referencing his height so far. Well, he is Bildad the Shuhite. The Shuhite. <laughs> the height of a shoe? <laughs> okay. All right, I get it. Uh, but they're, they're piling on. You, you had Aliphaz pointing the finger at Job. And now you have as the second friend coming on doing the same thing. Job, it's got to be you. And they've even got Job uh, doubting now, asking God if I've sinned. Well, just forgive me, please forgive me if if it's my if it's my fault. They're even putting the doubt in Job's head. And we know Job doesn't even know at this point that it has nothing to do with Job's behavior it's it's not it's it's not uh, a result of his bad behavior and it, it's not the chastisement of the Lord as we learn in the book of Hebrews that God chastises those that he loves like our father chastises his son job is not suffering from chastisement he's not suffering from the law of reaping and sowing he's part of a, an experiment that is going on so that Eric and Cindy and Luke and everybody watching now, we can learn from his experience. He's there so that we can see uh, that uh, even as we suffer, look how much Job has suffered. I, I said this before, but when I was finally last year being released from the hospital the last time, 
and I was waiting in the hallway to be released in a wheelchair. A doctor walked by my room and entered the room across the hall from me. And I heard the conversation. The doctor said, the test results came back and you have cancer. You, you can have chemotherapy and radiation, but considering your age, you might not want that. And I got off my pity pot at that very moment. I was, I was at the point where I'm saying, God, why? Why is it that the surgery had a complication and I had to have a second one? And then I had to have a third one. And then I had this complication and that complication. Over and over again, every week, I'm getting more, more bad news. And finally, I'm just feeling so discouraged. Lord, everybody's praying for me. I'm praying. I've been begging you for healing. I'm, and, and, and look, I just continue getting more bad news. And then I see this person across from the hall. I don't see them, but I, they're behind that wall. And they got worse news. And it gave me perspective. I say there's a saying that, uh, you know, I was so sad because I had no shoes until I met the man who had no feet. And when we meet Job in this story, it gives us the perspective. So no matter how bad I have it, consider Job. All right. Your reaction before we go on to the next chapter, brother. Well, Brother Luke, um, I feel that uh, the hospitals have dropped the ball in not offering to their patients the good news of Jesus Christ. I think that particular patient uh, would have uh, benefited greatly from uh, hearing the, that good news about Jesus Christ uh, before he heard the good bad news about his cancer uh, okay back to you yeah that would have been wonderful if uh, that was part of the hospitals but uh, it was not a Christian hospital I mean that was not uh, one of the services they provide unfortunately but uh, but let's Let's thank and praise all those people who do go into hospitals and into prisons and, and help and find people who, who are in really dire straits and, and they're willing to spend their time and make, the, make an effort to tell people the good news about Jesus. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to Job chapter nine. Uh, and Job's answering that uh, Bill, Bill Dad. Then Job answered and said, Yes, I know it is true, but how can a mortal man be right before God? If one should want to contend or dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has ever defied or challenged him and remained unharmed? It is God who removes the mountains, and they do not know it. When he, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not shine, who seals up the stars from view, who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea, who made the constellations, the, the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, and the vast starry spaces of the south? Who does great things beyond understanding, unfathomable, yes, marvelous and wondrous things without number? Behold, he passes by me, and I do not see him. 
He moves past me, but I do not perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can restrain or turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? God will not turn back his anger. The proud helpers of Rahab, the arrogant monster of the sea, bow under him. How can I answer him and plead my case, choosing my words to reason with him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer. I must appeal for mercy to my opponent and judge. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he bruises me with the tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to catch my breath, but fills and saturates me with bitterness. If it is a matter of strength and power, behold, he is mighty. And if of justice, who can summon and challenge him? Though I am innocent and in the right, my own mouth would pronounce me guilty. Though I am blameless, he would denounce me as guilty. Though I am blameless, I do not care about myself. I despise my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When his scourge kills suddenly, he mocks at the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges so that they are blind to injustice, to justice. If it is not he, then who is it that is responsible for all this injustice? Now my days are swifter than a runner. They vanish. They see no good. They pass by like the swift boats made of reeds, like an eagle that swoops down on its prey. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad appearance and be cheerful and brighten up. I am afraid of all my pains and worries yet to come. I know that you will not acquit me and leave me unpunished. I am accounted wicked and held guilty. Why then should I labor in vain to appear innocent? If I were to wash myself in, with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, you would still plunge me into the pit and my clothes would hate me and refuse to cover my foul body. For God is not a mere man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court and judgment together. There is no arbitrator between us who could lay his hand upon us. Would would that would that were would that there were would that there were okay? <laughs> let him take his rod away from me, and let not the dread and fear of him terrify me. Then I would speak in my defense and not fear him, but I am not like him, but but I am not like that in myself. Hmm. Okay, brother, what do you have to say about that? Well, Brother Luke, this is an amazing chapter, I think. Uh, especially now down in verse 8 where it says and treadeth upon the waves of the sea now that's talking about Jesus who walked on the water and this whole verse is actually uh, this whole chapter is actually talking about how futile man's attempts at any type of relationship with God and is, is, is possible by man's own attempts and uh, only God himself can fix that. Hmm. Well, two things really stand out to me in this chapter. Uh, one is Job's understanding 
incorrectly that God is behind this. God is responsible for this, that God is orchestrating it and causing it. That's incorrect. Um, see, uh, the Bible is 100% true, but uh, not everything in the Bible is correct. Now, that might sound strange, but th this truly happened. These, Job truly said these things, and yet Job's wrong. What he's saying is not doctrinally or uh, correct uh, in, in his understanding of God. He thinks God is causing this to happen. And as we, we know, in, in the, the first couple of chapters, we see that God's not causing it all. He's just not stopping Satan from doing it. And that's totally different. That's the difference between Calvinism, their, under, their interpretation of predestination uh, and uh, uh, not uh, sovereignty, and the correct understanding of sovereignty. God is sovereign in this respect. He has the power and ability to do anything he wants to do. But he doesn't choose to exercise control over everything. He did not make me say those last words I just spoke. He left me as a free person to say what I want to say, to think what I want to think. He's not controlling me like a robot and a puppet. That's what a Calvinist believes. God believe, they, uh, Calvinists believe that sovereignty of God means that he controls every action of man, every thought, every word. God is actually doing it, and we're just puppets on a string. But the true sovereignty of God is that God is able to do that if he wanted to, but he chooses not to because he wants man to be have free will. Only with free will can God and man actually have a true love relationship. If man did not have a free will, he could not love God because, but because love has to, has to be, uh, there must be freedom. If, if we were robots, and even though you, we can act like we love God, it's not really love because God is making us do it. So here we have a misunderstanding by Job. And, and someone, a Calvinist, could take this and say, see, Job is saying that God controls everything. God is making all the bad things happen. That he... he, he he, he makes the, 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 the good things happen and the bad things happen. He's not, that's not the case at all. So this is how an example of so many other things that we could cite in the scriptures that the scriptures say something, but it's saying something that's untrue. Another example is Jesus and Paul told, tell us about a group of people called Sadducees. They were a sect of the Jews who believed there was no resurrection. And they teach there's no resurrection. It's in the Bible. They say there's no resurrection. But we know there is a resurrection. So you have to conclude that there is either a contradiction in the Bible or that, or that uh, uh, it's, it's true with what the... What the uh, Sad you say, there is no resurrection. What do we do with that? Well, we have to accept the fact that some people are teaching things in the Bible that are not true. And here Job is expounding and saying things that are not true because he doesn't understand that God is not causing it to happen. As he says here in these verses, he's saying, uh, 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 
Oh, where was the verses where he's saying that uh, he caused it to happen on the... Verse 17. 17. For he bruises me with the tempest, yeah, uh, and he multiplies my wounds. So see, there, there's an example. He thinks that God is causing this to happen to him. There's other examples uh, farther down. Let me see. Okay, verse 24, the, the earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges so that they are blind to justice. If it is not he, then who is it that is responsible for all this injustice? It's like one of my doctors uh, a couple of months ago, he said to me, he says, well, now that you're uh, you're f feeling so much better, uh, you know, you're able to do more things. What do you do with all your with your spare time? And I said, most of my spare time is spent in Christian ministry work. And he, oh, really? Well, tell me about it. So I got to, an opportunity to tell my my surgeon about Christianity and my ministry and what I'm doing and about my YouTube channel and and um, and he he said to me, he says, this is my number one question about Christianity and the Bible. And that is that I see so many bad things happen to people. I mean, here he is a surgeon and you know what he sees in his work and also things he sees in the world, the bad things that happen in the world. He says, how is it God could let all these bad things happen? So I made a video as an answer for him. And then, and the video was titled, uh, I am thankful that God allows evil to exist. Now, if you think that's a shocking thing to say, then I would refer you to my video. It was made just a couple of weeks ago. I am thankful that God allows evil to exist. And if you, it's like 20 minutes long explaining why that is a, a, is a fact. He allows it to exist. He's not causing it as a Calvinist would believe but he's allowing it. Why would he allow it? Well, watch that video for a complete thorough answer to the question. Um, but, okay, so my, try to get my trend of thought right. The first thing from Job I'm learning here in this chapter is that Job is under the false impression that all the bad things that are happening is God is orchestrating it. And then number two, the other thing that I noticed in this chapter is that he says we have no advocate. Verse 33, there is no arbitrator between us. Well, uh, at Job's time, there was no arbitrator. But is that true today, brother? Is there no arbitrator between man and God? Uh, no, that is no longer true today because Job is happy to know this as a fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our arbitrator. Yes. So until the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, it's true there was no arbitrator. That was the problem. Man needed an arbitrator. Man uh, was in a hopeless situation. Uh, no one is perfect. And God requires perfection of us. In order to be with God, we, we have to be sinless. Because of sin, man and God cannot come together. There's a barrier. No matter how hard man tried to be good, he, he had a certain amount of sin on him, and he even had a sinful nature 
and it's repugnant and God could not embrace us. So until the cross, until Jesus' death on the cross, that was the obstacle. Sin was a barrier. And, uh, but since the cross, the sin barrier has been removed. A picture of that is the curtain in the temple in Jerusalem. The scriptures tell us that when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake and that the temple, the, the curtain in the temple that separated the Holy, from, Holy of Holies from the outer temple area, that that curtain was there to separate because no one could go beyond that point where, where God resided in the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the high priest would go there to, to um, uh, do his their ritual, but that, that um, curtain represented the barrier. Well, when Jesus died on that cross, that temple was torn open in half. And that's a picture of this sin barrier being removed. <clears throat> so now man can have access to God because the sin barrier is gone. And, and Jesus is the arbitrator. He's the one that when we, when we go, if we went before God, we normally would be guilty, but, but because Jesus paid for our sins, he said, God does not find us guilty. Because Jesus points at, points at us and says, no, I paid for their sins. He, he, he has eternal life. He's with me. He's covered with my righteousness. We, we cannot be found guilty because Jesus solved our problem. <clears throat> so in Job, when it says there's no arbiter, before the cross, it was true. Um, I'll go on to the next uh, chapter, but uh, what's your reaction to the, uh, the two, my two conclusions about that chapter once that Job is presenting a false uh, impression for everybody that God is somehow causing evil and that there's, and that there also that there is no arbitrator, but there is an arbiter now, brother. Yes, brother Luke. Uh, as far as the arbitrator, thank God that God loves us so much that he did send his son to save us from condemnation and by giving us new life in Christ Jesus. As far as Job uh, accusing God, I don't really, I'm not really too hard on Job for that because I do the same thing. Uh, confession time here. Okay. I I do the same thing to God all the time. <laughs> and and he forgives me. There's forgiveness every day. Pray for one another and lay hands on one another for forgiveness and health. And this is the, the scriptural recipe that God has given to us uh, to... Uh, Continue uh, in fellowship with one another in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'll move on now to uh, chapter 10. Um, uh, Job is continuing. It's a, it, his statement here, he says, I am disgusted with my life and loathe it. I will give free expression to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me and declare me guilty. Show me why you contend and argue and struggle with me. Does it indeed seem right to you to oppress, to despise and reject the work of your hands? and to look with favor on the schemes of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as a man sees? Are your days as the days of a mortal? Are your years as man's years? That you seek my guilt and search for my sin? 
although you know that I am not guilty or wicked, yet there is no one who, who can rescue me from your hand. Your hands have formed and made me together. Would you turn around and destroy me? Remember now that you have made me as clay, so will you turn me into dust again? Have you not poured me out like milk and curdled me like cheese? Have you clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? Have you granted me life and loving kindness and your providence, divine care, supervision has preserved my spirit? Yet these present evils you have hidden in your heart since my creation. I know that this was within you in your purpose and thought. If, sin, if I sin, then you would take note and observe me, and you would not acquit me of my guilt. If I am wicked, woe to me, for judgment comes. And if I am righteous, I dare not lift up my head, for I am sated and filled with disgrace and the sight of my misery. Should I lift my head up, would you, you would hunt me like a lion. And again, you would show your marvelous power against me. You renew your witnesses against me and increase your indignation and anger toward me. Hardship after hardship is with me, attacking me time after time. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? Would that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I should have been as though I had not existed. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Would he not let my few days alone withdraw from me that I have that I may have a little cheer before I go and I shall not return to the land of darkness and the deep shadow of death, the sunless land of utter gloom as darkness itself, the land of the shadow of death without order and where it shines as thick darkness. Well, would you say that's a diatribe against God? <laughs> yes, Brother Luke. Uh, in the previous chapter, he was just getting warmed up, and uh, now he's just releasing everything. He really doesn't understand that God is not doing this to him. That, uh, and he, he not only thinks that God is doing these things to him, but he thinks that all the bad things that happen, that, that God does those things. That's, that, that's the routine. That's the way God operates. So as good as Job is in some ways, he doesn't understand God in this, in that, uh, in this way that uh, God is not the uh, author of, of sin and the, and the orchestrator of evil and bad things. Um, and he certainly is saying, you know, I wish I'd never been born. I wish I was dead. Can you at least give me just a, a moment before I, before I die of just peace so I can be happy for a moment? Okay, let's go to Job 11. Um, oh, no, now the third friend, so-called friend, decides to, to uh, let his opinion be known. Then Zophar, the Namathite, Namathite answered and said, Shall a multitude of words not be answered? And should a talkative man making such a long-winded defense be acquitted? Should your boasts and babble silence men? And shall you scoff and no one put you to shame? For you have said my teaching, a doctrine, that God knowingly afflicts the righteous is pure, and I am innocent in your eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to speak against you, and that 
that he would show you the secrets of wisdom for sound wisdom has two sides know therefore that god forgets a part of your wickedness and guilt can you discover the depths of god can you by searching discover the limits of the almighty ascend to his heights extend to his widths and comprehend his infinite perfection his wisdom is as high as the heights of heaven what can you do it is deeper than Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead. What can you know? It is longer in measure and scope than the earth and broader than the sea. If God passes by or, or rests or calls an assembly of judgment, who can restrain him? If he is against a man, who can call him to account for it? For he recognizes and knows false and worthless men, and he sees wickedness. Will he not consider it but a hollow empty-headed man will become intelligent and wise only when the colt of a walled donkey is born as a man <laughs> if you direct your heart on the right path and stretch out your hands to him if sin is in your hand put it far away from you and do not let wrongdoing dwell in your tents then indeed you could lift up your face to him without moral defect and you would be firmly established and secure and not fear. For you would forget your trouble. You would remember it as waters that have passed by, and your life would be brighter than the noonday. Darkness then would be like the morning. Then you would trust with confidence because there is hope. You would look around you and rest securely. You would lie down with no one to frighten you, and many would entreat and seek your favor. But the eyes of the wicked will fail, and they will not escape the justice of God, and their hope is to breathe their last and die. So we have the third friend joining in. They're all, all in agreement, that, uh, and, and even Job is even now under the impression the bad things that are happening to him are because God is doing it and Job is saying it's not justified I'm I don't deserve it and he says if I if I did it if I did sin you know uh, uh, you know I would uh, I'm sorry but he, he doesn't understand what he's done that would cause God, God to afflict him in this way so they're all under the false impression that God is causing the afflictions. And uh, we're privileged to have read the first two chapters and know about uh, Satan's uh, conversations with God and Job. Uh, so they don't understand what's really going on. And, uh, but I find that not only this time of Job with Job and his friends, but in the, in the world, to, to, uh, even today, there is so much uh, incorrect uh, understanding about God, who he is, you know, that God is an angry God. To, people think God is angry with the world. God is causing all these things to happen, and, and he's, uh, he wants to burn people in hell and, and that the only way you can get right with God is is to repent of your sins and change your life and you better become perfect and hope you know, good and hope it's good enough otherwise you'll go to hell yeah. these are the these are the common misconceptions and false teachings that are there dominate the world today and just as we find these things uh, uh, in the epistles, there is all kinds of false teachings that can be traced back back to the first century. Here we go back, who knows how long before the time of Jesus, even centuries before we see a misunderstanding about God, that God desires to, you know, punish people and God is actually causing bad things to happen and, and that it's all because of man being bad that these bad things are happening so all right brother what do you think of this last his third so-called friend and his tirade against job 
Well, Brother Luke, it seems to me that the diatribes are escalating in their intensity and uh, it was a very astute uh, observation of yours, the problem with the perception of God by the uh, majority of uh, the population, which is a, a, a major problem, not only for the lost, but for so-called uh, believers in Christ who are believing a false gospel of uh, works salvation, which is foolish pride. And uh, it's up to us. It's on us uh, to, uh, and I do believe that God has given us the tools to fix this, uh, I believe that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I believe if we get the true gospel out there, that all men, mankind is under one commandment by God, and that's to believe the gospel, uh, that gospel of grace will do its thing. Okay. Okay, amen. I, uh, I, I'm i really enjoying the, our study of Proverbs and of Job, but uh, I'm also anxious for it to be over because uh, I, I've already got in my future plans uh, some uh, new subject matter that I'm really excited about getting into. Uh, one of the things we'll do is we're going to go through the Gospel of John verse by verse uh, um, can't wait for that to happen but then the the other thing is uh, another pro future project we'll take on is we are going to trace the false teachings that are common in the world today and there's there's many there's probably at least five or ten that we will take on that are traced back to the first century that we find them all these are none of them are new heresies. They're all things that are written back about in the epistles. So we're going to go back and trace those back and discuss those. So I'm really anxious to do all those things, but we need to complete Job and we need to complete Proverbs and then we'll go on with those. But for now, uh, we'll end this uh, subject of jo uh, Job here with this chapter. This is a uh, that was chapter number uh, 11. So we'll start with chapter number 12 next time, next Sunday. Uh, but for now, let's, let's end the broadcast for today, this study, the way we always do, talking about the one subject that is essential. A person doesn't have to understand Job. They don't have to understand Genesis. They don't have to understand the book of Revelation. They don't have to understand a lot of things uh, in, uh, in order to go to heaven. There's one thing they've got to understand. There's one thing that they've got to get right if they want to have eternal life in heaven. Let's talk about that here in the remaining few minutes that we have here. And the first thing I would say is that um, the common belief in the world today and for that matter all throughout history has been the false teaching that man can go to heaven based upon personal merit that what determines whether we go to heaven or to hell is how good we are if we're good enough god accepts us and we go to heaven if we're not good enough we end up in hell so this is the kind of the religion of the world today and the world throughout the, the, the religion of all times past is that somehow salvation and eternal life in heaven was determined by our own personal merit. So let me ask you to talk just for a moment about uh, uh, personal merit. Can anybody get to heaven through personal merit? Okay, Brother Luke, thankfully we know that uh, that is not possible. Uh, no one is good enough. Uh, sin has infected the very core of our existence, 
and it can only be erased by the blood of Jesus Christ because only his blood is pure and sinless uh, without any corruption which has befallen uh, our universe and this was from the very beginning to send his son to die for our sins on the cross and to be buried and to rise again on the third day according to scriptures and by us believing that and believing on him and his sacrifice for our sins we can have new life in Christ Jesus it's that simple it's it's in the Bible it's scripturally sound and if anybody says any other gospel it's it's not in the Bible it's it's it would have to be uh, created by uh, doctrines which are are uh, not in the Bible and uh, people need to repent of these false doctrines and believe what God's Word says it's that simple okay okay um, those people who believe that they can get through heaven uh, to heaven through personal merit. Uh, I want to ask you, how good would a person have to be in order to get to heaven through personal merit? How good would they have to be? Well, Brother Luke, they would have to be perfect. They would have to be uh, sinless. Uh, we know that according to the word of God all men are sinners and uh, if anybody says otherwise they're calling God a liar yes uh, so the, the standard that we must meet if we want to get to heaven on our own merit would be perfection uh, in other words people are under the false impression that God has some kind of a scale and he, the scale, they want to tilt in their favor. So on one side, they stack up all their good deeds. And on the other side, they stack up all their bad things, their sins. And they want the, the scale to tilt more good than bad. And they think that, that if there's more good than bad, the scale will tilt and they, now they, they've earned heaven. Uh, but the problem is that the scriptures tell us that, that uh, the, the righteousness of man, the good deeds of man, are all like filthy rags in the sight of God. God does not value our good deeds. He puts no value on it at all. So first of all, any good deeds you put on this scale, just get rid of them. They don't count. They count for nothing. The only thing you've got on the scale are bad things. So the scripture says that uh, no one is good, no, not one. No one is righteous, not even one. It says, we all fall short of the glory of God. So all you got here is no good that counts, only bad. And that's how the scale tilts. And that's why we're all guilty. So what are we going to do about it? We, the good deeds don't count. The bad deeds, we can't, we can't get rid of them. It's like, like warts. If you, if you went to, to, to get into heaven and there was a sign above the gate and it said no warts allowed and every time you've ever sinned in your life your body got a wart on it representing sin well if i went there i would have like a million warts all over my body and so i know I, I can't get in and and if someone else went there and they they only had one wart on their whole body they can say, well, Luke, you're, boy, you're certainly not going to get in with all those warts. And I'd say, it says no warts allowed, not at all, not one. you got a wart. I can see one wart on you. You can't get in either. That's how strict the standard is. So what are we going to do? Well, God understood our dilemma. So, so 
he became a man named Jesus and he died on the cross and he removed all those warts. He washed us clean and made us pure and perfect. But so we have no warts. So now we can get in because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But we can't get in unless we put our faith in Jesus. So that's the thing that people need to understand. If you try to get in through personal merit, the standard is so high, none of us, none of us can reach that level of perfection. That's why we all need Jesus Christ. So that's the important thing to understand that uh, you cannot go to heaven on personal merit. Therefore, the only way to get into heaven is based upon the merit of Jesus. There, there was a transaction that took place 2000 years ago when Jesus was dying on the cross. It says he became sin for us. He died for our sins, and not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. This, he's the propitiation for our sins. That means that, he's, that he made the full payment. All of our sins were put on Jesus Christ, so our sins are gone. Now, when we put our faith in Jesus, his righteousness is credited to us. We kind of traded places. Our sins were put on him. His righteousness is credited to us when we believe in him. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is believing that through personal merit, I can't do it. But through Christ, I will go to heaven. Only through Christ, because of my faith in him. All right, brother. Um, one thing we didn't talk about is the resurrection. They, they nailed Jesus to the cross. He suffered and he died on that cross and he was buried. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. Now, why is this resurrection so important? Well, Brother Luke, uh, we can't have the gospel without the, resu the resurrection because uh, the resurrection proves that Jesus has the power over life and death. And... He gives us that life inside of us. There's a new creation inside everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. And that girl, uh, and that is the only way, and it's imperative that all men receive this gift of, from God of forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ Jesus, and that they do it uh, this very instant and not wait at all. Okay. Amen. Uh, the, Jesus had performed a lot of miracles. He fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and small fishes. He gave sight to the blind. He would heal the lame and they walked. He healed lepers. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. And after doing all those things, these self-righteous religious leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, they demanded he give them a sign. Even after all the miracles he performed, he said, give us a sign. Prove who you who you are. He says, the only sign I want to give you now is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. This he spoke of referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. He would die. He would be buried in the tomb for three days and three nights and then come back alive again. So he promised us this resurrection sign to, as the proof that he is who he claimed to be. He is God manifest in the flesh as the son of God. He is the savior, the only way to get into heaven through faith in him. He had the power over life and death and he proved it by raising himself from the dead. And this resurrection is why that I have confidence in Jesus. 
the resurrection justifies my faith in Jesus. As Paul says, if he was not raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. The resurrection is why we can be have this blessed assurance and be confident that he is who he claimed to be. He will keep his promise that he will resurrect us to life everlasting because of our faith in him. All right, brother, we've we've completed this study for today. And uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, you've had a good time talking about Job. It's it's an amazing, it's an amazing subject. It's just, uh, it's going to be so interesting to see in the future chapters when, when Job starts talking to God and God, you know, gets a little irritated with Job too. I've got a lot of interesting things to look forward to in this study. So uh, thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody will join me every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time uh, for the next episodes of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Um, why don't you and Eric, you, you and if Cindy wants to, uh, uh, give any closing thoughts you may have. And uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Brother Luke. And Cindy sends her thanks as yes. well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we have to go take Tonto to work right now. Okay, so I'm out of here. Love ya. Bless you. Thanks for joining me, Cindy. Bye. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.